week this week. Let's try that again too. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Well, I think we should do better now. I mean, I see people yelling at the Carolina game on Wednesday night. Um, in my household, when I keep trying to tell Crystal, my baby, you've got to calm down, really. I mean, it's just a game. It's just a game, Crystal. And um, Roy can't hear you call timeout and, uh, and things, too. So, I mean, like Crystal, calm down, should really, you know. And so, uh, this morning, I want to, uh, to let's give God the same glory. I heard about somebody posted this past week, said, uh, trying to remember exactly what it said. Said you would be at the Super Bowl screaming for your team. How about be at church screaming for God? That's right. Amen. Amen. So uh, we want to give God glory and honor and praise this morning. So uh, we want to, I hope that's the mindset you came with this morning. I do want to let you know about a few announcements. We will be showing War Room tonight here at 5 o'clock in our sanctuary. We'll be here. We'll have popcorn and things too. We want you to come. Thank you for those who uh, took care of getting the popcorn. We'll figure that out too. Um, but uh, we were gonna we we're gonna have that. And I want to say thank you too uh, to Miss Shelley who's came graciously and started cleaning in our hallway yesterday. If you walked in our hallway and look, how many magic erasers was it? Twelve magic erasers just in one side or so of our hallway, one side, one end or whatever of our hallway. Uh, so that tells you how nasty our church has been. So we cleaned that. That's been cleaned. It's been worked on. Deep cleaning has been started. Uh, she's graciously doing that. Uh, just to give back to our church, and I'm thankful for that. Thankful for what she's doing in that too. Uh, thankful for the families that are coming. Pastor Ron and kind of this week, all the ones who said, "Hey, we'll come out and help clean the church." Thank you for that. That saves us about five thousand dollars a year. So that's great. We can put that towards other youth to try to reach people for the cause of Christ. Um, also, too, um, <clears throat> want to let you know that um, be in prayer. Uh, Miss Chelsea uh, lost her grandfather last night, yesterday. Pray for her and her family, and if you don't know who Chelsea is, raise your hand, Chelsea. Pray for her and her family, and um, and uh, she told me last night, I, I, I just want you to know I think God's at work when we're not even realizing it. Uh, I, I, uh, it's kind of emotional for me this week anyway, so if I cry today, I just cry. My little boy turns 14, he's not a little boy anymore, and um, he played his last middle school game yesterday, and I'm like, man, this kind of stinks, and, and um, I was sitting there going, man, are you serious? He's really growing up, this is... Crazy, and then Chris tells me this morning, we're getting really old, you know that? <laughs> so, uh, my sleep pattern has been off this week. Uh, uh, I got up at 2 o'clock on Saturday morning. I could not get back to sleep. Stayed up all day yesterday. Crashed in my recliner about 11.30 last night. Got up again at 2 o'clock this morning, 2.30 this morning. I was up to about 4 or 4.30 this morning. Laid back down and got up again and ready to go. So, uh, I, I don't know. If you go to sleep today, I promise I'll try my best not to go to sleep on you. If you promise not to try to go to sleep, try, try to promise not to go to sleep on God. Amen? If you go to sleep on me, it won't offend me at all whatsoever, honestly. So, uh, at least you're here. But, uh, um, we, uh, Chelsea, Chelsea said to me yesterday, she said, you know, my, my mom was raised Catholic, my dad's a Mormon, and so um, when I left uh, yesterday, she said, uh, they want you to, they would like you to speak in the service. And, and I, I take that as a huge honor. And um, I told Chris, I said, you don't think God's working? When they ask an uh, old Baptist preacher, you know, this, this really young and dumb and, and, and definitely not a traditional dude at all whatsoever to come speak at a, at a funeral of a, of a wonderful man that, that was, whose family was, is Catholic and, and now uh, part of their family is Catholic, part of their family is woman, and they decided to ask him to come speak and say something about it. So praise God, because our God can do everything. Amen? Yeah. And so I believe that with all my heart. I believe that to be in prayer for Shannon. She's traveling. She's a member of our praise band. She used to miss this morning. So Anna like, graciously has stepped up and was like, hey, she's good. I turned your mic way up, by the way. And um, yes. And uh, so anyway, she's taking on both the girl parts this morning. She can do it, I promise you. And uh, and so thankful for that. Um, the devil fights, and uh, I believe he fights, and I, I know who wins. We had a new drummer come and practice with us Wednesday night. Uh, the first time he hit the sticks on the, on the drum pads, I was like, man. I said, all right, this is a great fit. It's really good. Well, last night, they think he, they thought his mom had a stroke, so he was with her all last night at the, at the um, hospital, and then couldn't find out it's just Bell's palsy. Thank God for that, but he was up and out. And so he will be out this morning. I was like, man, first Sunday. Man, oh, man. And I told Chris this morning, I said, I believe that's the devil fighting. And um, we want to continue to pray, and if he's the one that God would have to bring, God's going to work all that out, and God's going to take care of it. We haven't worried since August. We got one that can play the drums, thank God. Thank God he's multi-talented. I checked, text Travis this morning and asked him, I said, hey man, could you go to the drums with the guy? I was like, yeah. So I'm thankful that we have people willing to serve. 
Uh, if you take our new member of Sunday school class, I promise you, you will get it for real. Um, one big announcement I'm excited about that's coming up. Um, next Sunday is actually Baptist Women's Day. Uh, so come here. The ladies will have our whole service from start to stop. And, uh, and it'll be one service at 1030 next Sunday morning. We won't have two services next Sunday. It'll be one service at 1030. So um, please be here next Sunday morning. Sunday school will be at 930. Um, and then also, too, on the 6th, we'll be doing Harvest America here that night. Um, and it uh, starts at 630. And that is where you can invite people. We want you to. We don't want you, to, I don't mean to say that we don't want you to invite church people. We want you to invite people who have never surrendered their life to God. People who, not, not, not people that walked out, you know, I mean, people that walked out and all that stuff. We're not looking for that. We're looking for people who have never surrendered. They could have walked out a hundred times. They could have been dumped a hundred times. But they've never said, hey, you know what, God, I'm yours, man. Everything I got is yours. Here I am. Take me. I want to surrender my all to you. That's who we're looking for. And, and we want to reach out to those. I don't know about you, but I got friends and family that are like that. And so that is, that is what... Greg Glory will be bringing it's, it's a live simulcast from uh, Dallas Cowboys Stadium, the Cowboys, and um, and so they'll be here. Uh, that we'll be doing that on Sunday night, March the sixth. Also, the one I'm really excited about is March the thirteenth, the next Sunday morning. John Ham, our director of missions for our association, will be here that Sunday morning. Uh, spent some time this week and in, in, uh, at our association office. I uh, was asked to come in, uh, all the pastors from all the churches. We have sixty-four churches, I believe it is, in our association. And uh, what that means is we, we actually follow in our association. We're an autonomous church, which means nobody comes in and tells us how to run the church and how it's supposed to be run and tells us who's going to be your pastor or whatever the church decides that. And, and uh, uh, it's, it's not like, and this is not a knock on, it's not like the Methodist church where they, the, the group picks up where the pastor is and says wherever or the Pentecostal church where they might decide where the church of God has a overseers and they decide where to move around the pastors. Um, the way it works in, in the Baptist church is this is an autonomous church. The church decides who their pastor is and, and so on and so forth. As I told them when I came here, I'm not really a, a true Baptist. I'm a Baptist I believe in letting the Holy Ghost roll and have its way because there's, there's a God here three in one. And so um, I met with the association office this week and there was 100% participation from all the pastors in our association in this. They were asking us some dynamics of our church where we feel like our church is going, where we feel like the direction our church is going. Uh, what we feel like is best needed in our church, what we feel like is best needed in our community, and things too. And we had to come up with numbers and all those things and all. So I had to get those from Glenda, but I, I'll be honest with you, I don't, I don't keep up with it and everything too. And if I'm not mistaken, I want to say there was 108 or 109 baptized in the last seven years uh, since I've been here, and there was 192 uh, that's joined our church. So praise God for what He's doing in a one stop like town. We're thankful for what He's doing. Uh, he's an awesome God. And, and, uh, but at the same time, uh, I was talking to John Ham, our director of missions afterwards, and we were talking about how what a healthy church looks like. And, and he said, you know, the church has to understand what a healthy church looks like. And um, so he's, he's coming in, he does that training and things, but he's coming in on the, on the 13th to preach that morning, um, not to preach as a healthy church, not to preach, he's whatever God's laid on his heart to preach, he's going to preach just so you as a church can be familiar with him. And then in the next couple weeks after that, we'll schedule a Sunday night training session. And I want every one of our church, if you want to be a member of our church and an active member of our church who really wants to seek after God and do what God's called to do from, from eight months old to 180 years old, we want you to be here. He's going to, he's going to start off a, a training session with us for what a healthy church looks like and how we can, we can become a healthy church. And, and, you know, I, I understand it's been seven years I've been here. I understand all that. But, you know, I'm, not, I'm like you. I'm not perfect. So um, I, I thank somebody who's got wisdom in that, can help us out with that, we can see that. And so he'll be here as a training session for that on a Sunday night. After that, he's coming on that 13th, that Sunday morning, just to bring the word powerfully uh, to us, whatever God's laid on his heart, and to set it up so you can you can relate who John Ham is. Um, he's a wonderful man, served in ministry for union years as a pastor, and now he's the director of missions for our association, which is our local association in all of our churches. Helps out all of our churches. He, he started, it was very key in starting the Enjoy Thrift Store in Rocky Mount um, there. He was a big part of that. And so I want you to be here on the 13th. Definitely want you to be here every time the doors are open. But uh, I want you to be a prayer too. For We want to be a healthy church. Amen? We want to be a healthy church that's thriving for God. And remember what we said the other week. What is our mission as a church? Where broken people come to find new meaning to life. That's what we want to be. We want to be a place where broken people come to find new meaning to life. And that means every week. Uh, how many of you go through struggles during the week? I do too. 
Okay, so we want to be a place where healthy, where, where, where broken people come to find new meaning to life, and, and that, is, that is in Jesus, because every week He's restoring, every week He's restoring us, and every week He wants us to be serving Him. Our, our last new member Sunday school, I almost don't even want it to be over. Our last new member Sunday school classes this morning, um, they get uh, coffee and, and Krispy Kreme donuts that were hot now when I picked them up last night. So uh, if you're not in a new member's class and you've never been in a new member's class, you should have signed up to go. So, uh, you got coffee and donuts last morning, but uh, this is our last one, and I, I'm looking so forward to it. And one of the things that the Bible teaches is, uh, and, and I believe this is on my heart, is that as a church, it's not about us. It's not about what we like, what I want, how I want it, when I want it, where I want it. It's about serving God. And He tells His disciples who were arguing over who was first, who was best, who was this. He was like, you know what? If you really get it, you serve to be last. Your desire is to be last. How many times have you ever been to a fellowship at a church and everybody just rushes through the front of the line? You've ever seen that? See, I, God's been getting me a long time ago as a pastor to say, hey, you know what? It's okay if I go last. I want to go last. You go ahead, I want to go last. Because I know what that scripture means. It means the last shall be first. Okay? So I might be the last to get in that food line and I might not look like it. Okay? Because the buffet really don't have a line when I go to I eat a lot of buffet, so you, you can't tell and so, uh, anyway, they, they, uh, we want to be, we want to, we want to be a church that, that, that desires to be last, but be first to serve. And you know, that's where I believe God's really calling our church to go to. So, if you're looking for direction for this year, I, I, I told our, our men in, in the Bible study the other night, last year God was beating me over the head all year long with obedience, 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 be obedient to me, do what I told you to do, do what I told you to do, when I tell you to do it, how I tell you to do it. This year, he's beating over my head. Men, you need to stand up and be the church, including myself. We need to stand up and be the leaders of the church that God's called us to be. And the only way that the men can stand up and be the leaders of the church God's called us to be is we start pouring into it. So next and last are my announcements, and, and some other people may have them. But last of my announcements, March the 18th, we will have a men's night. Uh, that night on Friday night, we'll come together that Friday night. We'll go out to eat. It's for all men and all teenage boys in, in uh, sixth grade and up. And so we want to we pour into those boys. We want to pour into the men and each other. Uh, we're going to come. We're going to go out to eat. We're going to come back here. And we're going to have uh, devotion. Whoever God's laid on people's heart to, to lead that night. I've already got one that's contacted me and said, hey, you know, God's just laid on my heart. It's not even somebody I would have thought would have spoke. And so God's already working in it. So they're going to, whatever, whatever they speak on, we're going to say, hey, how does it relate to us as men? How can we apply that to our lives? And then, then we will actually break off in, in groups of two and, and pray with one another. And, and we're going to try to do it with someone that you don't even know. Because we want men and, 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 and young men to connect in our church. And we want them to connect there. We want to build those relationships so that we can say, hey, we want to pour into them. We want to disciple you. You disciple me. Let's get this thing together. Let's work this thing together. We're going to spend the night. Okay? So if you want to bring your sleep back, if you like sleeping on the hard floor, that's fine. Um, I'm, I'm an old guy like my wife says, and um, I'm not sleeping on a hard floor. i got an air mattress I'll bring. Uh, my little girl told one of the guys we were talking about it. She said, that pew's comfortable. <laughs> and so I said, well, you can sleep on it every Sunday. So, I mean, you must be I mean, really come. You can sleep on the pew. We're going to spend the night here that Friday night, that Saturday morning. We're going to get up and eat breakfast together, pray together all as a whole group, and then we'll be dismissed. So you'll have the whole weekend after that. So we're just asking for a Friday night. And a Saturday morning. Thank you. I'm so proud of you, those who finished the men's Bible study. Those of you who didn't, talk to the guys who did. Uh, we plan on doing another one to start up uh, here in the next little bit. Um, either either Every Man's Battle or um, or I think it's Conqueror is the next one that Tony Evans does too. Um, talking about the, the armor of the body of Christ. And putting on the armor of God and everything we do. And uh, Excuse me, I'm sorry. I, I almost fell out. And uh, my, my other son came home. And so I've been wondering where he was at and everything, too. So when he, I told him the other week, I said, when you become a big star, baby, uh, just remember us little people. So y'all don't forget the name of Deer Thompson. I promise you, he will go somewhere and play something that's Forbes. He's a phenomenal young man. And raise your hand, buddy. That's, that's my other son, I claim. And, and, uh, and he's a phenomenal young man. He plays at Southern. And, and uh, he's, he's, a, he's unreal. I think he's like a robot as far as the body. I, so I'm running one day, I looked on a picture, Sam said, look at his arm. I'm like, man, mine are just like that too. <laughs> and Sam like, no, they're not. They're not cut all up. I mean, you see like every little the definition is arm, so hope to be like that too. And uh, so we, we, we uh, put the CCS as a football team if you want to come really and do a picture. It's just a plug. So, um, 
And I uh, pray too uh, for for uh, um, the school at CCS and, and uh, for Andy as he starts and we start his baseball. He's going to come in. I, my, I'm thankful for him, not only just that he's a coach and a friend, but that he pours into kids, man. Um, he pours into kids in and out, in and out of school and things too. And uh, we had a situation this week went on and a kid we love and and dearly love. And, and I, I told his dad the other day when I talked to him, I was like, dude, you, I want you to understand something. We show grace. Uh, I understand we're, we're not representative of the school. Uh, we don't, we don't, we don't, we can't stand, you know, and tell you what we're going to do. I'm not the administrator. I'm not in, on the board and all that stuff. Um, I understand there's rules and we have to abide by rules, but we're going to show grace because that's what God shows us. And we want to love and we're here for you if you need us to. So um, just be a prayer for, for that situation. God knows all about it and, and I'll be a prayer for those things. Any other announcements anyone has this morning? Just real quick, I uh, wanted to let all of the youth parents know if your child is going to camp this year, they're going to get a letter today um, just like this that just tells how much the cost of camp was um, and then how much their balance is. Um, the, the, youth, the church paid $50 for each kid who wants to go to camp. Um, and then everything that, that they raised from the Yankee Candle fundraiser, the uh, Christmas Spaghetti Dinner Theater fundraiser, and the uh, Valentine's Steak Dinner fundraiser, um, was divided amongst how many kids participated um, in that. And so each one of those had um, that amount divided and applied to their account. So, um, you know, whatever the balance is after that um, and the $50 deposit that everybody's parents have already paid, uh, that's what's left. That amount will be right here. Um, it is due on uh, no later than April the 30th. But also, uh, most importantly, is there's a link at the bottom of this page. Every child who's going, their parents have to go on that link and sign them up and fill out the waiver form and all their medical information and so forth um, in order for them to be able to go. So make sure you get this from your child. They'll have one today. Um, if they don't have it, um, make sure you get it because they do have it. Or come see me and I'll make sure um, you know, that we get it to you. Um, but they have to have that, both the money paid by April 30th and that link. Um, information filled out by April the 30th or they cannot go to camp this year. Thank you. And then children, you meet today at 3 o'clock for our drama and um, ladies, 4 o'clock, if you will please come, let's sing in the bar for next Sunday. Um, also too, uh, as we give these next two certificates out to these two wonderful young people, um, we also have um, <laughs> to announce it with that too. We will do this first. This says certificate that cert this, this, cert this certifies that Lydia Lane Hill was baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit by Charlotte Baptist Church on February 7, 2016. And this this certifies that Lydia Lane Hill has been receiving the full membership at Charlotte Baptist Church on February 7, 2016. So she'll come at this time. We had the prettiest and the, and the ladies go first, right? All right, Cole, she's pretty. And this, this certifies that William Colby Hill was baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit by Sharpsburg Baptist Church on February 7, 2016. And this certificate of membership certifies that William Colby Hill has been receiving the full membership of Sharpsburg Baptist Church on February 7, 2016. And so he'll come at this time. And then if Lynn and Dave would stand up at this time too, Lynn is their mother, Dave is their stepfather, they stand up at this time. Uh, they come desiring to, to uh, form a, a relationship with our church, to become members of our church, uh, confessing Christ as a Savior, and baptized full submersion baptism, come on a statement of faith today, and I'll accept motion to accept them into the members of our church. A motion. A motion. Second. Yeah. Second. Yeah. Second. All in favor? Yeah. Amen. Y'all have a seat. Uh, and uh, praise God for, for what he's doing in that too. And I'm thankful for that. We never know, uh, honestly, as children come. And I was reminded this morning when I was looking at their certificates. Um, I walked into Seth's game yesterday in Wake Forest and, um, at the seminary and walked into the gym. And I was sitting there and I looked up ahead of me, two seats ahead of me, from the other team that we were actually playing. And I looked up and I saw this lady sitting there. And I was like, man, that looks just like Diane Barry. And... Um, who was a counselor when I was 12 years old in a church camp in Virginia. And I was like, Diane? And I thought, you know you know how you do that? If you think you see somebody, you know you kind of stand behind me and just call her name, see if they turn around and look. I know it's all, that's what I do. And I see them like, hey, Diane. And 
She turned around, I was like, man, it is her. I was like, hey, Daggy, how you doing? I was like, is, is it you? She was like, Todd, what are you doing? Um, and so her youngest daughter was there. Her youngest daughter was like a little bitty thing when she used to come to camp and do that. And uh, she was a counselor. She was there the two summers that I got kicked out of camp. And uh, kicked out of church camp. My mom had to come get me. And, um, and so I hadn't always been, you know, the straight-laced guy. And uh, one of them was for fighting over a girl. One of them was for punching a hole in the wall uh, in, the, in the bathroom. So uh, I, I've, I've always I've kind of been the tough kid anyway. She was like, I cannot believe you're a pastor now. I was like, yeah, I know, right? And uh, her, she said, you were a camp pastor for us one summer. And, you know, have you been back and everything? No. We started talking. And I was like, man, it is a small world. Her daughter lives in Lake Forest now, our youngest daughter. Her oldest daughter, Michelle, who was my age, was kind of like my little girlfriend at camp that summer. She was one I got in the fight over. She passed away three years ago with cancer and uh, has, has uh, three children. And, and uh, Ron came and spoke at the camp that she was, her daughter was at, Kayla. And uh, she came and visited. They came down to visit us when we were in New Life. And I was a youth pastor there. Donnie remembers them, Kayla and Krista. And, uh, and so their grandmother. And so you never know, honestly, um, the, you know, the chance you have. She said, Todd, uh, we want to come visit you. But I actually prayed. I said, how's Kayla doing? She said, she's, she's doing okay. But she's kind of had, had a falling back into, into a life that she shouldn't be into. She's living with me now. Just pray for her. And I said, listen. Can you give her our number? I want to pour into her. I want to. I want to. I want to really want to pour into her because you know her mom was really. Uh, she was really a friend. It was like a little summer girlfriend. I was like twelve, but she was really a friend. And all through through high school, she was friend. We were great friends, and uh, she married and had had children and things. And she developed cancer and uh, was in remission, and it spread and, and took her life. And so I know where she's at today, and I'm thankful for where she's at today. Um, but I just want to tell you that, really, really take notice today of everybody that comes in your path because you never know how you'll meet up again. And uh, so I'm thankful for these children, thankful for what they're doing, and, and I look forward one day to seeing them serving in the church uh, in a perspective that, that they would never thought they would have because I was that kid that got kicked out of church camp for watching my mama had to come get me. She's, her mom's favorite saying is the only place she never had to come get me from was Paris Island. And look at this good grief, our God is so good. Um, walking in the back doors, and I'm going to embarrass him right when he walks in, um, was one of my football players at, uh, at, at uh, New Year's Hockey and, uh, and, uh, and uh, he was my running, one of the running backs at, uh, at, at, at Toys Not and then at, then at Fike, and uh, I've seen him at the gym, and as Jerome and I would walk through the gym, Ron can tell you, walk through the gym, and, and he walks around, and, and he doesn't have to walk around like we do, okay? You don't have to walk around like that. He already walks around like that, relaxed. And uh, I was like, walking well, there one day, I was like, that is not him. Are you serious? Did you guys look forward to it? I was like, man, that is not him. Golly, that is him. And so then invited him to church. He's like, man, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. So every time I see him, I say, thank God for, for him being here too. I love you, man. I'm thankful for you being here. So he bless you too. At this time, if the ushers come forth, we'll take his tithes and our offerings this morning. Father, whatever be done, 
on an outreach to glorify your Son. For it's in his blessed name, for his sake, I do pray. Amen. <laughs>
that praise this morning. This morning, he deserves it. Amen. Yes. Yeah. Uh, children, if you'd like to go to Children's Church, would be dismissed at this time to go out with your teachers. And uh, I uh, want to tell you, as they go out, you know, uh, I was sitting there listening. I was like, man, listen to that. Um, Seth was really excited this week. We were talking, he was like, look, you know what? He was like, Anna, Anna and Shannon, boy, they're harmonizing with us, man. Their harmonies are like on point. That, man, you don't hear that. Well, I heard it a little bit Wednesday night, uh, and then, uh, then I went to record, and, and Anna had left us after nine. So I posted, I was like, after nine is stink. I hate not, not having after nine. So she had left, she had to leave, but she could drive after nine. And uh, praise God for all these kids going out. Hey, man, that's awesome. That's your church for tomorrow. I mean, that's your leaders, that's your preachers, that's your deacons, that's your, that's your elders, that's your Sunday school teachers that are going out, thank God for them. But uh, it's, it's, this morning I was, I was listening, uh, the harmonies are on point, man, for real. I mean, that was awesome. And uh, thank God for what he's doing there, praise me. Amen? Yeah. This morning, uh, we want to continue in the book of Acts, and uh, I titled the sermon this morning, God Follow Those Best. And, uh, you know, that's, that's a, a, a saying that you've heard probably many times, but uh, not this father. Not, not me as a father, as, as Seth's father, but as the father above, our God knows best for our life. He knows what the future holds. He knows what happened yesterday. He knows what happens now. He knows what's going to happen tomorrow. He knows best in our lives. And sometimes we go through this right here. I saw something somebody posted the other day, and it's in my plan. And it was a person on a bicycle, and they're riding, it's a straight line. And then underneath it, it said God's plan, and it was a person on a bicycle, and it was many valleys, and going down, and up and down, and hills, and going up and down, and up and down. And that's exactly what the Christian walk is like. Uh, when people tell you that, hey, man, you turn your life over to God, and you give your life to God, and you surrender your life to God. See, that's what Jesus did. It's not about, as we said earlier, it's not about walking by out. And it's not even about baptism. We're back, we believe in full source of baptism because Jesus did. Jesus says that he came straight way up out of the water, which means he had to be under it, come up out of it. So to be Christ-like, to be a Christian means to be Christ-like. Like Christ is why we believe in full source of baptism. That doesn't save you. That the walking the aisle doesn't save you. Uh, coming to church doesn't save you. What saves me is surrendering my life. That's what Jesus did. I want to be a Christian means I want to be like him. I want to surrender my all. He didn't get on the cross and give a piece of it. He gave his all on the cross. Yeah. And, and, and that's what saves us. That's what saves us. That's how we know we're saved. There's no one in here, no one in the entire world that can take my salvation from me because they didn't give it to me. God gave it to me. And it's a free gift that he gives to us. And he wants us to respond. And he's looking for us to respond. And he's looking for thanks for his children. Let me ask you a question. Do you expect your children to do what you tell them to do? If you have children, do you expect them to do what you tell them to do? Trust me, I've seen some of you. Spirit of God, beat the child. That's my, that's my word for the Bible. Amen. That's my translation. Spirit of God, beat the child, and that's us for the You know, it works. You know what I'm saying? It, it did for me. It worked for me. I promise you, I'm a, I'm a preferred believer, and it works. I think David was telling me one time they got back sticks or whatever they could get back in and whip them with things too. And uh, my mom was whatever she could get. And I told you before, she had to whip his back in in all of the east, east coast of the United States. And uh, you didn't talk back one time. And so she, growing up, had to be my, my, my dad and my mom. And uh, until my dad here, you see, you, and you know today, so my dad came into my life in 2001 as my daddy. And I'm thankful for that. But she was, she was my mom and my dad growing up, and she was it. And she taught me what it's like to be a man, and I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for the respect that she taught me, too, for, for ladies and, and things, too. And I, I'm thankful for what she is, but our Father knows best in all things. In everything in your life, His plan, even when it's hilly, is way better than our plan when it's straight. Because you know what? When you go through those valleys, and you come back out on the mountaintop, there's peace. Everybody, you ever heard there's peace in the valley? You heard that song, there's peace in the valley? How do you have a peace when you're down? Because you got the one who gave you your life. Yeah. He gives it to you abundantly. Ron preached another Sunday for God's children. He, he, he works for the good for those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. So therefore, He can't work good in your life even in trials and tribulation, until you're his child. So this morning, I just want to share with you from 
the book of Acts. If you have your Bibles, you can look with me. Uh, if not, there's a pew Bible in front of you you can look on. If not, it's on the screen there behind me too. God's Word says in Acts chapter 12, beginning in verse 12, when he realized this, he went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where many were gathered for prayer. He knocked at the door in the day, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to open it. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, instead of opening the door, she ran back out, back inside and told everyone, Peter is standing at the door. You're out of your mind, they said. When she insisted, they decided it must be a baby. <coughs> Meanwhile, Peter continued knocking. When they finally opened the door and saw him, they were amazed. He mentioned for them to quiet down. He motioned for them to quiet down. And told them how the Lord had led him out of prison. Tell James and the other brothers what happened, he said. And then he went to another place. At dawn, there was a great commotion among the soldiers about what had happened to Peter. Herod Agrippa ordered a thorough search for him. When he couldn't be found, Herod interrogated the guards and sentenced them to what? Death. There was repercussion that came for not doing what they were told to do. Afterward, Herod left Judea to stay in Caesarea for a while. This morning, I want to tell you this morning, as children of God, there's things we got to do. As children of God, the Scripture tells us what we should do. The Scripture tells us as children of God where we're at. And I want to, I want to, I want to bring you back to where we were before. You know, uh, it, it, as, we, as we talked about this, you know, last week we talked about Peter, and he was he was placed in prison, and as he was placed in prison, you know, he, he was he was he was thought of, uh, Herod was going to bring him out after Passover, and he was going to try him, and and he was going to be tried and most likely be put to death in and all. And, and, and if you don't remember, if you weren't here, the angel of the Lord came in and said, you know what? Get up. Chains are loose. The chains are broken. He's no longer bound at all whatsoever. And he said, follow me. And Peter walked out and followed him. And the whole time Peter thought it was a dream. And he gets out and he walks past the, get past the, the guards. And as he walks out past the guards, he gets out and the angel leaves. And then he realizes this is really for real. And he realizes that this is real. He's like, oh, hold on a minute. And as we talked about before, the church has a job. The church has a duty to their brothers and sisters in Christ. And that is that when we're down, not to kick them, but to lift them up. To lift them up. And so as we look at that this morning, first and foremost, in verse 12 through 14, this morning, as we go in there, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you this morning. We give you praise, honor, and glory. Speak, Lord, right now. Forever, Lord Jesus, have your will and way. Love us, Lord God, as you already do. And help us, God, to love you. Help us to love one another. Help us to realize that in our imperfections, you're perfect. Help us to realize, God, that even though all of us are hypocrites, no matter how great we live our life, we never measure up to your son, Jesus. Help us, God, to realize what you call us to do and to do what you call us to do. In your son, Jesus, is mighty name we pray. Amen. As we look at verse 12 through 14, pray and respond. In, in, in verses 12 through 14, uh, 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 pray together outside the church. Where did it say that they were praying at? Where did it say they were praying at? In a home. They went to a home. He went, as Peter returned, he went and they were all praying. They were all gathered together and they were praying. Let me read this to you just so you're with me here this morning. Here's what the scripture says. When he realized this, he went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where many were gathered for prayer. When's the last time we gathered in our houses to pray? We used to have college prayer meetings. I remember I used to make fun of it when I was, when I was little. You know, when we were getting ready for revival. We would have college, I call them college prayer meetings. And I didn't understand cottage cheese. I didn't understand. I call it college cheese. And, and, and now, now, you know, as I look back at it, I look back and say, why do we have that? And our revivals are so much stronger. Where is our world at today? Our world is in the, in the ditch. Maybe you can blame the president. You can blame the leaders in our country. You can blame everybody. But I blame the church. Because the church needs to take a stand for what's right. Amen. And it starts with men. 
It starts with us men. And you know, it's not our responsibility. I've heard this before in church. Oh, well, we're a babysitting service. The youth group there, babysitting service. The people come drop their kids off and everything leave. Praise God they drop the kids off. Because you know what? Let's pour into those that God brings into the house of God. Let's pour into them that they can take it home and reach Mama and Daddy. And when they reach Mama and Daddy, Mama and Daddy start to come. That's right. Amen. Yeah. God's called us to. And you know what? It's just a shame when the youth of our community and the youth of our church are killing us as adults. They're not like me. You're right, they're not. They want to be changed. They want to be loved. They want to be different than others. They seek out to have an identity. Hello, do you understand where it's going? What did Christ do? He wasn't like the world. He sought out to have an identity, didn't he? He wanted people to see God in him. Look at it. Look at our churches today. We got to pour out of one. I was talking the other day and I was like, hey, you know what? Just as much as it's his job to pour into these youth and to pour into these youth, it's my job to pour into the church and pour into the church. But first of all, we got to be leaders in our families first. We got to be leaders in our homes first. And you know what? Here's, here's where the real rubber hits the road. You got to know as a church that I care about you outside these walls. That's right. He's got to know that you got to know as, a, as his, their leader, he cares about them outside these walls. That's why he's got to be active in their life. He's got to know how to be active in your life. When you call, I want to go. That's a pastor's heart and desire. You understand that? And I believe with all my heart, he's put us together for a reason. He's brought us together for a reason. He placed us together in ministry for a reason. And, and you know, if we pray only in this church, and yes, we pray for you right here where my feet are right here this week. We pray for you as a church that God would place here whoever you have to be here and that the message will be for them this week. Because let me tell you something. The message is for me. If it ain't for you, it's for me. I promise you. God is powerful and He's strong. They were praying together. Hold on a minute now, okay? Their buddy had been locked up. Put in jail. Oh, he deserved it. He deserved it. He should have gone to jail for what he did. He did wrong. He shouldn't. They, they broke the law. Right? A lot of times that's what we say. But can I tell you something? If I got what I deserved in life, I wouldn't be standing before you today. If I got what I deserved in life, I wouldn't be a Christian. That's right. Because I deserve hate. You deserve hate. Every one of us are sinners. We all fall short of God's glory standard, and every one of us deserve hate. Yeah. But a man named Jesus, who was 100% God and 100% man, got on the cross and gave his life so that you and I didn't have to pay that price. Right. Amen. Yes. That's where it is. They were praying together outside the church. Okay? I put that in there so that it would, you could really relate to it. Because really, it wasn't they were praying together outside the church. They were praying together as the church, outside of the church building. <coughs> so many people refer to this as Sharpsburg Baptist Church. This is not Sharpsburg Baptist Church. This is Sharpsburg Baptist building. Yeah. The church is this. Yeah. Right. When we go out into the streets, and hopefully in the next month or two, we'll be having a prayer walk together. And when we have a prayer walk, I want to go that this is where God's really convicted me. We had a young man in our community got the devil beat out of him. Beat him within an inch of his life. Three guys beat him within an inch of his life. Left him for dead. They're charged with, 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 with uh, attempted murder. Went to see him a couple weeks ago, and this happened in December. He's got a helmet on because he had to have part of his skull taken off. He's visiting our church and, 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 and come to our church sometimes. And I would tease him because a lot of times he'd come and be out in the parking lot after church. And I'd be like, Brady, church started an hour ago, dog. Why didn't you get in there? He said, I'm glad that you came. Why didn't you come earlier? You know, I tease around with him and things. When I walked into his house two weeks ago and saw the helmet on his head and saw his temple of his head swollen out to here, he was beat so bad in December. You could tell as he talked and as, his, as he made motions and things that something was still not quite right there. Something set a fire in me that said, you know what? We need to take back over our streets. We need to take back over our community. Amen. The church is too quiet in the community because we're scared. I don't walk around scared. I buy a total pistol, and I took two guns, and I took a two-edged sword. That I'm not scared of anything. They take my life, I know where I'm going. We need to stand in our community, walk in our community, and say, hey, you know what? That ain't happening here. The church is quiet because all the church is in this community and in other communities is right here inside the building. We got to go out. They were praying together outside the church building. Second 
saying that Peter knocked. He knocked at the door of the gate. Can I tell you something this morning as a church? God's knocking this morning on your heart doors. And he doesn't force himself in. I don't care what people tell you. He doesn't force himself into your life. <coughs> he gave you a free will to choose what to wear this morning, didn't he? People argue. I, 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 I debate with people over this all the time. You know, well, well, no, God's going to have his will in this way in your life no matter what. He is, but he wants you to surrender first. His will is that all will be saved. But if the scripture, if that was the case, if he forced himself into your life, the scripture wouldn't say, you must confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and you will be saved. See, you wouldn't even been involved in all that. Yes, lest Jesus come. Understand total depravity. Lest Jesus came and died on the cross, we would have no hope. None. But he wants me to confess him, not, not all I just confess my sins, to tell my brothers and sisters, I gotta tell everybody. I know a man one time stood up at church and told it all, and they were like, hey man, and the brothers in the back, this is heard a story one time, a man stood up and he's like, I'm gonna tell y'all something right now. I have a problem with drinking a little bit. And they were like, tell the preacher, like, tell it all, brother, tell it all, brother. He's like, yeah, I have a problem with uh, cussing sometimes. And he's like, tell it all, brother, tell it all, tell it all, brother. He's like, yeah, I have a problem with, with uh, lust sometimes. He's like, tell it all, tell it all, brother. He's like, and, and you know what? And uh, I have a problem with, with love so much that I got several affairs and everything. And my wife's sitting right here and everything. She's got a gun in her pistol. I wouldn't tell that, bro. <laughs> Come on, Richard. <laughs> Peter knocked. Jesus is knocking at your heart. Yeah. I'll tell you this. He's waiting for you and I to open the door. Yeah. I want to tell you, I opened the door January 2nd of 2000. was raised in church my whole life. I knew the whole church thing of going to church and being part of the Frozen Chosen. You know, this is where, this is where you sit like this. That's why I left my props up here. This is where you sit like this. That's church. Can I get an amen? No, that didn't say that. Can I get an amen? Amen. And this is what the older men did in our church growing up. <laughs> this is what the teenagers did in our church growing up. <laughs> laying down in people's laps. I remember laying there as a lady they read a tanner. She would rub my hair every Sunday morning, boy. I remember like it was yesterday. I'd go right to sleep, lay right in her lap. Here I was, probably 12, 13 years old. I told her, I said, when I turn 18, I'm going to marry you. <laughs> then all of a sudden, she got married to crush my heart. That was church to me. Then I understood, January the 2nd of, of, of 2000, at 27 years old, God, I need you, man. That's right. Come on, bro. I need you. And I don't need you to be the, the one that's in my life, and I want you in my life, and don't want you when I don't want you. I don't need to be the one that just walked out and told the preacher everything he wanted to hear at eight years old and got baptized and, and thought I was everything right. God, I am messed up and jacked up and I've done so many things and I feel you knocking at my heart today and I feel your Holy Ghost presence speaking into me today and God, i got to surrender. And I give you my all and as jacked up and messed up as I am, take me, mold me and make me into what you want me to be. That's right. Amen. 16 years later, I'm here. The servant girl responded. See, they prayed. Peter knocked. And she responded. She came to open the door and she recognized Peter's voice, the scripture says. And she was overjoyed. And she didn't open the door. Jesus says in, verse, in John chapter 10, verse 27, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. We must recognize the voice of the Lord and He will know us and we must follow Him. Do you understand what He said? He said, My sheep know my voice. Listen to that part. My sheep know my voice. Or listen to my, I'm sorry, my sheep listen to my voice and I know them. I don't know about you this morning, friend. Do you know what no means there in the Bible? What that type of no means is an intimate relationship with him. Remember back when, when they talked about, when they talked about uh, uh, 
Joseph, and they talk about Mary, and the Bible says that Joseph had never known Mary. We're all old enough in here to understand what that means. You know, she was a virgin, and Joseph had never known her. There was an intimate relationship that had to happen. They were talking about their intimate relationship together. And, and understand something? For you and to, for us to, to know him, he wants us to have an intimate relationship with him. And we're to know his voice. Can I tell you this? Satan's voice is loud. Satan's voice is strong. And that he seeks to destroy you. That's what the Bible says. He seeks to destroy me. I, I believe with all my heart this morning that because I was praying this week and, and I knew it. I was like, man, this is a drummer and everything. Yeah, he still may be a drummer. I'm not saying that. Don't get me wrong. He, I believe he's still who God brought here. To be here when he's not practicing everything that's great. But I thought, man, God, the devil's fighting something. The devil's fighting hard for him. He was so excited what coming. This happened to his mom. And, 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 and I understand. Praise God that it wasn't a stroke. Praise God it was Bell's palsy. If you don't know what that was, if you ever watch WWE, Jim Ross, that happened to him too. He never got it back. See, I was a red hole wrestling guy. That's how I relate to it. And I hope she gets everything back with it. But I was like, you know, Satan's fighting for a reason. He's fighting for a reason because he seeks to destroy the service on Sunday morning. He seeks to destroy me as your leader. He seeks to destroy Ron. He sets traps for pastors. Do you understand that? A servant girl responds. You know what I find really, really crazy about this story is this. The church is praying together. Adults. Are you with me? And when the knock at the door happens, a little girl goes to the door and responds. If someone knocked at the back doors of our church today, <coughs> right now in the middle of the service, would we allow a little girl to go up in that door? I, I would hope not. I believe a lot of times many people do. I was sharing with Justin last night. It's like I remember when growing up. Joe's witness come knock on our door, boy. <laughs> Y'all know. They turn the TV off. <laughs> Close the blinds. Don't you walk by the door. Don't walk by the window. They might see the shadow. I, I can hear my mom like this yesterday. It won't, it won't turn, turn the computer off. We didn't have no computer. We didn't know nothing about no computer at the time. The computer we had was called typewriter. And you had to go back and hit that. And you had to use some kind of tape or something to get up to do that. And that was that new invention when you could go back and use tape to correct what you type. I remember and I was like, man, we were so scared of it. You can ask me why now we were on vacation one day. And all of a sudden there was a knock on the door where we were staying on vacation. I opened up the door and the guy said, hey, I'd like to talk to you for a minute. And I was like, okay, Chris was like, it's John. Let's wait for the door, shouldn't we? Vacation. <laughs> well, if you know me very well, Hey, how you doing? <laughs> All right, yes. You like talk? Oh, thank you. They give you a pamphlet. Turn it over to the back of it. Look for JW in a square box. Okay? They don't tell you, hey, we're Jehovah's Witness. We're going to come to your door. We don't tell you that. They want to tell you because let me tell you something. A lot of them know more about your beliefs than you do. You know why people don't want to open the door? Because they don't want to really respond because they're not secure in their salvation. They're not secure enough in the Word of God. We wonder why our families are falling because men are not secure enough in the Word of God to sit there and defend what they believe. I said to this young man when I opened the door, I was like, hey, I said, uh, great, man, thank you for giving me this. He was like, uh, I want to talk to you about something. I was like, I want to talk to you about something too. I was like, I'm a Christian. You're a Jehovah's Witness, right, J.W.? That's what it's next for, Jehovah's Witness. He's like, yeah. I said, let me ask you something. Y'all think you're part of 144,000, right? They're going to be left here on the earth? Yeah. But the Bible says they're Jews. They're God's chosen people to be left to. You're not Jew, are you? Well, but no, I mean, I'm, and, and the second question is this. I'm not attacking you. I just want you to understand how I believe what you believe. Can you defend enough what you believe to me or to anybody else? Because I can tell you why I believe what I believe. And I said, if you are a part of the 144,000, why is there 1.2 million Jehovah's Witnesses now so what happens to the other 900 thousand people? You just hope you can get into the 144,000 and work your way into it? Because the Bible tells us that you can't work your way into salvation. You're not saved by your works. You're saved by the grace of God through this faith of His Son, Jesus Christ. That's what I want to tell you. 
Here's what he said. I said, can I pray with you? No, nah, you have a good day, man. I appreciate it, dear friend. All right. I said, well, I'm going to pray over you as you're leaving. <laughs> sad part is they don't have no idea why they believe what they believe. The biggest sad part for us as Christians, though, is we're scared to open that door. We're scared to respond to the door because we're not secure enough in our own beliefs. <clears throat> Secondly, today, he says, testify. We as children of God are to testify and be intentional about it. Rhoda intentionally testified of what she saw. She saw Peter and she went back and she was like, hey, Peter's at the door. Now understand something. They knew how powerful Herod was. They knew he was the king. He could destroy. Let's, this, this, this should give us a great hope. Do you understand? Donald Trump, I'm, I'm not a supporter. I don't endorse Donald Trump. Matter of fact, I don't endorse any of them. I, I, except for one, I'll tell you who I endorse. And you can go look it up for yourself. Marco Rubio. I can tell you, if you don't believe nothing else, he believes in God. And he believes in Christianity. He was asked by an atheist at a, at, a, at a place that he was living in, will I agree with all his political beliefs? Let me tell you this. I don't believe you'll ever agree with everybody's political beliefs. Not everybody. We, all, we can't even believe in each other's beliefs in church sometimes. But I watched the video and the atheist said, hey, can you, can you, can you tell me, you know, why would you force yourself on me? He's like, I don't, we don't force ourselves on you. But what's happened in our country today is as a Christian, I don't have the right to stand up and speak my beliefs, but everybody else does. I'm supposed to be quiet. Brother, we won't force you to pray. We won't force you to go to church, but you can't force me not to. It should be a choice. Can I tell you this? Prayer is out of school. Why? Oh, because the Supreme Court. If I want to go into school and pray today, I'll go into school and pray today. Lock me up if you want to. Somebody told me, said, Pastor, they, they made a, a, a homosexual marriage legal now, so you might have to marry homosexuals. I will tell you, and that's just recorded. They can see it all they want to. They can lock me in prison. I would never marry two men and two women. God created Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, and not Adam and Eve. Amen? Amen. He made it a woman and a man for a woman and a man. And, and, and realize something. That was the first church. You understand that? The church was, it was not established when Adam and Eve was created. They were the first church. Because what is the church's purpose? To know him and to make him known. Right. So what were they? They were to know him and they were to make him known. And they were to have dominion over all things. And they had a free will to choose whether to eat that fruit or whether not to eat that fruit, didn't they? Yeah. See, if they didn't have a free will to choose whether to eat that fruit or not to eat that fruit, that means God is the author of sin. That means he created them to sin. You believe that? I don't need it. I believe I serve, a, I believe I serve and I have a perfect God. Amen? Yeah. He's perfect. <coughs> there, therefore, there for good for all those people who think, oh, well, this is going to be saved, that one's going to be saved, this is going to be saved, but everybody else has no hope. Limits of atonement. He died just for the ones who are going to be saved. No, he died for all. And all men will be saved according right. to the scripture. Yeah. She was intentional about it. We're to be intentional about our testifying. No matter man's response. How did they respond to this little girl? She comes back and she's like, hey, Peter's at the gate. Peter's at the door. And they're like, whatever. No, he's not. It's got to be his angel. Because we are just like them when we think that it can't be done. No way in all God's green earth that God can still raise somebody from the dead. Let me tell you something, friend. I witnessed it with my own eyes. The doctor comes out and pronounced Allison Thorne dead four times. To her husband. There's no hope at all this river. We've taken her off the machines. For two and a half hours, she had no brain activity. You understand that? Those of you in the medical profession who know anything about medicine, if they had no brain activity for two and a half hours, their dead grief is gone. Amen? She's still alive today. You can't even tell her. Other than in her eye, if you look close in the pupil of her eye, you'll see a little dot there. That's it. Fully functioning. Loving God, member of society, serving Jesus. Four times. Nothing is impossible with God. You know, man's response to that was, hey, we've done all we can do. She's dead. That wasn't God's response. God's response is not our response. We're to testify in all of it. You know, I was sharing with uh, Diane yesterday. And I told her, I said, you know, um, never thought when I was that kid, 12 and 13 years old, getting kicked out of camp, being stupid. 
Never thought I'd ever be a pastor. Her daughter said to me, said, I remember I was like six or so. I was like five or six. Y'all, you did that song. You sung that song. What was it? It was a real popular song. And you sung that song and everything. I don't remember what she was talking about. She was like, do you remember y'all came out you put on makeup? And, and you came out and you had on, it was like yellow and black. It was striper. Back when striper was, some of y'all old school people might remember the first Christian rock group ever to take place was striper and Petra. Okay? And the church was like, <laughs> rock music in the church? A guitar? In the church? But your parents were the same way when you come home from out Elvis. <laughs> That's what I find out in that generation that hates that, that hates that music, and can't stand that music, and can't do this and that. They didn't listen to, to, to Southern hymns back then. They didn't ride in the road in the car to go pick the girlfriend going, Love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could have love lifted me. Come on, baby, let's go. Yeah, we're going to the club. That ain't what they did, is it? No, they had some Leonard Skinner. They had, don't, don't, don't fake. They had the Elvis. They had all the, all the ones that don't like the music of the day that the kids listen to. You didn't listen to the music back then either that your parents liked. Amen? But I'm thankful that every style of music you can imagine today, there are Christian artists who say, hey, you know what? I want to make a difference in that music. It's not the sound of the music. It's the message of the music. Yes. Uh, uh, you don't believe me? I can take that piano, and we can go over there right now, we can play the tune of Amazing Grace, and I can sing, Satan's number one, he's the greatest. Woo, go say yeah. The tune matters not. What matters is the message. Yeah. And in all things, we're to testify of Jesus. Yeah, I stopped by yesterday, listen, to look at my truck, and when it got in there, and I realized my transmission's blown up, see, so Satan will test you there, too. I mean, I put $1,700 on a new transmission last year, and it ain't got 2,800 miles on it, and the transmission's gone. <laughs> I, you don't get the flesh over that, I like to take it down. And God, ooh. Thank you, Jesus, for giving me grace and mercy. I got in there, and he, he had a plan in it. There was a guy when he got in the truck. He was like, man, what is that? And I said, what do you mean? He said, music playing in the back. He's like, didn't you say you were a pastor? And I was like, yeah. He's like, you listen to that? I said, dude, it's Andy Minio. And he said, you can't stop me. And he listened to it, listened to it. I said, continue to listen to it. I said, listen to the lyrics of it. Now, I can't do every word of it, okay? I can pick out the ones that they're wrong. He's a master artist, okay? <laughs> That's why he's a youth pastor and I'm a senior pastor because he can, he can relate to it, he can sing. We were at the concert for Lecrae last year in Atlanta, Georgia, and Chris was like, what is he saying? I'm like, here, baby, I downloaded the lyrics, I hit it to her. She said, he can say it fast. I, I know that's what he's saying, but he can say it fast and I can read it. I look back at our youth pastor and our youth pastor went, He knew every single word of it. You know what? I'm thankful he's like you, Pastor, because he knows what our kids are listening to today. Yes. You don't want your kids to listen to Hey Girl, Bend Over, and Show Me That, and all this stuff and everything. And that's the style of music they like. Give them some, give them some Christian rap music then. Because they're going to listen to that whether you want them to or not. They're going to listen to rap music whether you want them to or not. I want to place in their hands the Christian lyrics and a message of the gospel of Jesus Christ to say I understand you don't like rap. That's okay. I understand you might not like rock. That's okay. But for every style of music today, there's a style of music out there and there's musicians who are Christians who want to place in these people's lives and want to pour into these people's lives. And I'll tell you something that Lecrae said, who's the biggest Christian rap artist there is now in all the world. And he said, you know what? If Jesus is anything, 15,000 people in the, in, the con in the congregation there, in the, in the uh, Gwinnett Center, he says, if Jesus is anything in your life, he's got to be everything in your life. There's no halfway in and no halfway out. And he's a rap artist. He said, you don't call, he said, I like when people say, I don't like when people say I'm a Christian rap artist. He said, you don't call a plumber a Christian plumber. You call him a plumber who happens to be a Christian. He said, I'm a rapper who happens to be a Christian. Can I tell you this too? If he was really all that bad, he certainly wouldn't have been sitting at Billy Graham's 95th birthday at the head table with Billy Graham. Praise God. Look at our times have come. Would you have seen that 20 years ago? Heck no. <laughs> Thankful for today. Testifying all the things. She went no matter the response of them. She went and told what happened. She was like, hey, listen, listen, this is what has happened. Give God glory for everything and praise by spreading what he's done for you. Peter told without hesitation about what the Lord had done in leading him out of prison. 
He testifies of what God has done and looks forward to it. So here, understand, they went and opened the door. When they went and opened the door and saw who he was, because they listened to the testimony of Rhoda, they said, oh, we don't believe this. Let's go see it for ourselves. What did Peter say to him? The angel of the Lord came and led me out. He was like, hey, quiet down. Listen to this. The angel of the Lord came and led me out. Finally, they expect. Expect God's provision. When you're at your lowest, you expect God to provide what you need. I cannot make it in life alone. It is not by my power that I preach. It is not by my power that I live. It is not by my power that I'm a daddy. It's not by my power that I'm a husband. It's not by my power that I'm, that I'm a son. It's not by my power that I walk. It's by the power of God that lives inside of me through His Holy Ghost and through His Son, Jesus Christ, who wants to do a work in my life and who provides all of my needs. At dawn, after Peter had vanished in the night, there was a great commotion among the soldiers. They couldn't believe that Peter had just vanished. When he walked out and they realized, now all of a sudden, listen, Peter's already back and testifying about what God's done. And now Herod comes out and his pastor was over now, so they get up and come out and they look around. If you've ever been to Israel, you know that during Jewish holiday, they don't do nothing, do they? Everything's shut down. Even the convenience stores. Walmart will be shut down. I'm talking about not just one day, I'm talking about like the whole week. Everything's shut down. You don't find nothing. Except for the hotel you stay in, maybe. Nothing. The taxis ain't running, they ain't nothing. nothing. You usually walk. So after all that was over with, Harry comes in and he finds out what's going on. And, and, and they're like, oh, what happened? Can I take this? He sought to destroy Peter. Yeah. Satan seeks to destroy me and you. But God provided for Peter a way out. And he provided for you a way out today. He knocks at your heart today saying, hey, surrender. Give me and give up. The problem that you're dealing with, the things that you're dealing with in your life that are so tough for you right now, stop fighting the battle on your own. I stand with you and I'm in you and I will beat that battle if you'll let me beat it. Because you cannot beat the battle. You cannot win the battle. But the God that lives inside of you can. Yeah. He defeated Satan. Right. He defeated Satan. Oh, the devil made me do another. The devil didn't make you do anything if you got Jesus. But the Bible says he stands over him with the keys in his hands. He's defeated. The Bible says that one day every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. That means Satan himself will stand before Jesus and admit before all that he's Lord. You know what I ask God a lot of times in my prayers? God, let me be the one standing there. Let me be standing there when he goes, you're Lord. I'm going, yeah, you lie. Ah. All those times you got me alive, he won. Because ah. there's only happiness in heaven. Okay? There's no sadness in heaven. There's only happiness in heaven. Amen? And all of you that can't dance, when you get there, you don't know if he said dance. I, when I told him, told him one time in church, I told a couple guys, told him, said, you want to dance in church? I'll dance in church. Because I'm going to dance before Jesus. I'm going to win it. And I'm going to lay and I'm going to break it down. Go, God, go, God, go, God, yes, go, yes. If he tells me to break down and do the word, I'm going to do the word. I ain't doing it now. He ain't told me to do it now. Whatever he tells me to do, I'm going to do it. Because you know what the scripture says? I will be at the feet of Jesus doing nothing but worshiping him. And the crown will be placed upon my head. And I don't know about you, friend, but I don't want it to have one little jewel. I want it to be full of jewels. For serving him. God's provision, we should expect it, and we should expect people's unbelief. Right. You know what? A dear saint in our church said the other week in our men's Bible study, he said, You know what? Pastor, I don't understand why people claim to be your friends. They claim to be such good Christian people and go to church, but yet they walk away and they're hateful and ugly and they walk away and they tuck their tail between the legs and run. I said, Understand something, Mr. John. Church people are not Christians. Christians are church people. Yeah. You understand that? You can come to church every Sunday, sit on a pew, listen to the sermon, listen to the music, raise your hands. You can put on your little mask when you come in, and just like everything's great in your life, and you can act like, oh, you just got it, oh, you're so spirit-filled, and oh, yes, God's so good. Praise the Lord, brother, yes, amen. It's especially the ones when you see them, they're like, hey, hey man, how are you doing today? Oh, 
Oh, I'm just doing so great. I'm doing so great. Let me tell you what God's doing all my life. He's just doing everything in my life. God's just so good all the time. All the time. Every day of my life, I never have any problems at all whatsoever. Because every day I walk with him and every day he's, he's providing for me. Every day he's doing something. Every day he's going great. And boy, I never have any bad days. And I can smile and enjoy for all the time. This life is great. You liar. <laughs> every one of us have battles. Every one of us go through something in our life that's tough. The ones that tuck their tail between their legs and run are the ones that won't sold out to them to start. Because let me tell you something. There's a greater sickness in this world than cancer. I've had it, I know. I got the greater sickness. I've had cancer, but I've got the greater sickness in my life today. Than cancer. But friend, if you had cancer today, and the doctors have told you that there's no cure for it, you're going to die. And all of a sudden, Glenn comes up to you and says, Hey, I got the cure for you right here. I've created a cure for your cancer, and it will heal you 100%. You take that. <laughs> And you're healed 100%. Can I ask you a question, friend? Would you give that back to me? Would you? I certainly hope your answer is no. I certainly hope you wouldn't say, oh, I'd like to have cancer again and go through it again. I, I don't want to be healed here. Take this back, man. Can I tell you this? Even if you do, though, you're healed. Because when he gave it to you, the moment he gave it to you, you're healed. And it's not something you can give back. Healing, you can't give back to him because you're already healed. You know what? There's a greater sickness in the world other than cancer, and that's called sin. And Jesus Christ freely gave his life. They didn't kill him. He freely gave his life up. That's what the scripture says. He freely gave himself for us to become a living sacrifice that we wouldn't have to. For the greatest sickness that there ever was is sin. So if God's really given that to you, and you really receive the gift. You know what? I can walk up all day long and give Crystal a new, new, new gift. And I can say, hey, here's a, here's a house. Not a bracelet I bought for you, baby. Here it is. I give it to you right now so you can relate to these things, lady. Give it to you. This is a brand new house. Not a bracelet I bought for you, baby. If she doesn't receive that gift, is it hers? Is it? you got to receive the gift. See, God's given you his one and only son, Jesus Christ. you got to receive it. Let me tell you something. When you receive it, and he heals you of your sin, Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. The scripture says that grace is sufficient yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He already knows what you're going to do more. He already knows what's going to happen to you all. Who in the world wants to get that happen? Let me tell you this. I'm imperfect. I'm a hypocrite. I'm a sinner. But I'm a saint of God. Who's saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Who washes my sins and makes me as white as snow. The world and the church and the church members and everybody else can't save me. My mama can't save me. My daddy can't save me. My, my brothers and sisters can't save me. My friends can't save me. God saved me by the power of the Holy Ghost through His Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost conviction on my life that says, you know what, God, I need you much more than you need me. Yeah. And I want you to be the Lord of my life. I don't want a fire insurance policy to pay I want you to be the Lord of my life. Understand people's unbelief. Herod Agrippa ordered a thorough search for Peter when he couldn't be found, interrogated the guards, and he sentenced them to death. You see, he didn't believe. He thought it was the guards' fault. It's y'all's fault you should get out of here. The power of God made him go. Removed him. Amen? We should always pray and respond. Why? Because we're to talk to God. We're to respond to him. How do we talk to God? We pray. When we pray, we should be expecting God to do something. We're to testify about what He's doing, and we're to expect. Don't ask God to do something. Don't expect Him to do anything. I was praying this week, and as I was preparing for the sermon, I was like, God, God, move in our church. God, help us to have a healthy church. Help it to start with me. God, as a leader of our church, people can't go no further than the leader. God, I want to be everything you want me to be. And as imperfect as I am, and as a nasty, dirty, rotten sinner as I am, as a hypocrite as I am, God, fill me with your Holy Ghost 
that everything I can walk with you, that our church will follow you, God. The you not me, the you that lives inside of me. Let their lives be different. Let our lives be different. Let every day we wake up and give a death to yesterday because yesterday's gone. Yesterday's gone. You see, I testified the fact that I was in camp. I was a kid that was kicked out of camp. I was a kid that was kicked out of camp at 12 years old. That's where my downfall started happening. It started realizing, hey, you know what? I got a lot of anger issues inside of me because I grew up without a daddy. I realized at 17, I started smoking. 16, I started smoking weed. And I realized I started smoking it like it was my job. And I started selling it. And I quit high school in the 12th grade. May of my senior year. What an idiot, right? Went to the Marine Corps and thought, oh, man. You know, this is it. This is the answer. It made me a man. Parasite made me a man. But it taught me how to continue the party lifestyle I was in and the downward spiral I was in. Until a friend at 27 years old, I sat in the back row. I was a good Baptist. Sat in the back row of the church and realized that the Holy Ghost jumped on me. God, I got it. I got to have you. I need you. Man, I need you. And I got on my face at an altar and I said, God, I'm yours, man. Take me where you want me to go. Do what you want me to do. Make me what you want me to be. 16 years ago, January 7th. See the crazy thing is? Bobby Atkinson knew his old coach, who was nothing but a partying, drunkard, womanizer, with his clothes buckled like clothes down every night to the week. That ain't the same man that he saw walking to the gym. Say, hey, brother, we want to see you at church, man. Come see us sometime. We'd love to have you with us. Love you, brother. Well, I used to tell him all the time on football field, hey, man, I love you, dog. I love you, man. It's a whole different love today. It's a whole different love today. I don't love you because you're worthy to be loved. I love you because the God that lives inside of me loves you. And I'm the love like he loves. I'm the kid like he gives. With God, all things are possible. When we pray, respond, and testify, we should expect God to move and do amazing things. Why? Because our Father knows best. Our Father knows best. Friend, the trial that you're going through right now is for a reason. As we studied in, in Ruth, this past week tonight in there, and our meetings like Bible study, you should come. As we study through Ruth verse by verse, and we're going through the book verse by verse, we understand that tests come to prepare us to make us struggle for the next test to come. Don't believe me, go home today and read the book of Job. All his friends and his wife said, Curse God and die. All his friends said, We can't give up a long time ago. He persevered through all the turmoil and all the trials and all the tribulation. I ain't seen anybody in our church lose every single thing they got and get boils on them. You might have lost some things. I lost some things. I know some people who really lost some major things in their life. Family members gone. When they shouldn't be gone. At an early age, I, I tell you, a 21-year-old girl did her funeral. A nine-month-old baby I've done funerals. And I don't know why that happens. I don't. Friend, I can't explain to you why bad things happen to good people. But can I tell you and encourage you with something this morning? Bad things happened to Jesus this morning. He was perfect. And God delivered him. Just like he did Job. You see, Job persevered through it all. He lost all ten of his children. Five hundred oxen. And at the end, after persevering through it, he got a thousand. Everything he had was double. And he got ten children back. People said to me, Pastor, not everything was double. He didn't, get 10, he didn't get 20 children, no. He already had 10 children who were in heaven. He got 10 more children here on earth. That's 20 children added up. He got doubly blessed. If you want to be doubly blessed, it's one of you persevere through what God's told you to. You know why? Because in the challenge that you're in right now, in the trial that you're in right now, in the place that you're in right now, your Father knows best. If you stand to your feet this morning, if the Holy Spirit spoke to you this morning, as I pray for man comes and leads us this morning, understand God loves you more than anybody in this entire world can love you. He gave you life, He gives you life, and life abundant. He wants your life to be successful, but you've got to surrender. Your problem that you're going through and you're fighting on your own and you're fighting in the battle in your life and on your own, you will lose on your own. But with God, all things are possible. This morning, God's what you are, won't you?
comfort and all the stuff. They're like, hey, you know what? One thing I've got all see the church has to vote on. So we'll vote right in. You know, amen. We should never want to turn away anybody who wants to be a part of this family. Amen. Yeah. And so these are all that have joined in the past few weeks, uh, either by, by, by statement of faith or by baptism. Jimmy and Beth were up here at this grandparents too uh, the other week. And uh, so we want you to come back, stand the right hand of fellowship with them. Uh, and don't don't tell them the story now. If you're going to pray for them, tell them you're going to pray for them. Encourage them, love on them. They need it. You know, we need it. And understand that, you know, when you do something for God, the closer that you draw to God, the more the devil fights because he's lost. He's lost the battle in our life. And he's a, he's a loser. You got that? I pray that you go to Sunday school this morning and be back with us this afternoon at 5 for our movie. Uh, we, we'd love to have you. I tell you, in all the movies I've seen in all my life, War Room is one of the, the most powerful movie I've ever seen. And I think we need to be reminded of really what it means to, to do what God's called us to do. And I can tell you this, I challenge all of you to be back this evening at 5 o'clock. It's worth your time, I promise you. And it doesn't cost you $10.50 like it does in movie people. Okay? So we'll have some round sound and popcorn and all those things too. So come back this afternoon. We love you. We want you to be with us. And I'm going to ask Sean if he would just miss some prayer. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the opportunity to be here this evening. We thank you for the Children up there, don't forget to go yeah, to don't get your children. Get your children. <laughs>